When it comes to rivalries in sport, there are those at the surface level, two good teams vying for supremacy. And then there are those that take it up an extra step, that take root in the fabric of a country's history. And that's exactly what the Klassiker is representative of. It goes deeper than only football, you know? This is Ajax versus Feyenoord, Amsterdam versus Rotterdam. Those who, as the saying goes, dream while the others put in the work. They have some arrogance. They think Amsterdam is the best city in the world. Everything happens in Amsterdam. That's totally different here in Rotterdam. Rotterdam is more focused on Amsterdam than Amsterdam is focused on Rotterdam. And given Football Mirror's life, these sentiments carry into football as well, carving out a clash of philosophies on the pitch that helped shape one of the greatest rivalries in football. They seem to see us as a little brother, like, oh, how cute. And they, they try to do so well, but whatever they try, we're not good enough. Is it arrogance if you have the best stats throughout all those decades, or is it just realism? Hello and welcome to Ruona TV's Roots of the Rivalry. Last time we got into what makes South Africa's Soweto Derby, but for the first time in three years, we are back in Europe to cover the most historic derby in the Netherlands, the Klassieker. By the way, the voices you heard in the intro, Johan Brinkel of the Feyenoord podcast entitled Kain Galul, and Ajax, the YouTube channel We Talk Ajax. Their links are all listed below. And hey, for the English speakers out there, We Talk Ajax actually does Ajax content in English. Sadly, as of now, Johan and the guys from Kangalul are only doing coverage in Dutch, so apologies to the English speakers, but for anyone who speaks Dutch and wants Feyenoord content, I mean, they're your guys. Last thing before we get started, if you're new here and find yourself enjoying this video, maybe, just maybe, consider hitting that subscribe button. Hey, I mean, it's free after all, right? All right, let's go. AFC Ajax, the most successful club from the Netherlands, was started in March of 1900, but it was almost a reboot in a sense, or a relaunch, as there was a football club Ajax from 1894, but it failed to get off of the ground. The new club stuck, however, adopting the same name of the Ajax from Greek mythology, a warrior who fought in the Trojan War, and given he took his own life, he died unconquered. The club would have black kits at one time, but would establish the colors of red and white very early in their history, but just not in the style that you would recognize now. They had red and white stripes, but upon getting promoted to the top division in 1911, they had to switch their kits as Sparta Rotterdam already played in white and red stripes. So the big red stripe down the middle was born. The man who got them into the top flight was Jack Kirwan, their first coach who was a former professional, having played for Everton, Spurs, and Chelsea in the late 1800s and early 1900s. However, it was another Jack, Jack Reynolds, who would play a major role in Ajax's coming success and how the club operates. Reynolds would take the Amsterdam club up another level as far as their playing style and tactics, while also helping to develop their training methods, methods that would build the foundations of Ajax's philosophy of always developing talent in-house, the beginning of their iconic Ajax youth training program. Ajax would continue to develop under Reynolds for 35 years, with their first national championship coming in 1918, and another one a year after that, with Ajax winning at a consistent rate throughout history. They're sitting on 36 league titles at the moment. While professional football would come to the Netherlands in 1955, Ajax would begin their second golden era in the early 70s with Reinus Michels, the man who popularized total football. And of course, Johan Cruyff, one of the greatest individuals to grace the game. You couple these ideals with the talent in both coaching and on the pitch, and it's no wonder Ajax went on to dominate at the international level as well, winning the European Cup for three years consecutively, becoming the most popular team in the country, but still the pride of those from Amsterdam. What I love about Ajax is like the technical, skilled football with a lot of youth from the academy usually in that first team. We educate our players from a young age by a certain philosophy. That philosophy wasn't just a tired gimmick or something that they stuck to even if it hamstrung them competitively. No, Ajax continued to find success as the most decorated club in the Netherlands thanks to this approach. I was lucky enough to be at an age of nine or 10, experience that Champions League win, you know, in 94, 95. And even if you're not uh, a supporter of Ajax, if you saw that team, that philosophy, the mix of mature players and, and youth players and academy players in the team, it's hard not to love Ajax. People still talk about that team, you know, winning that Champions League. Would you say that that sort of, that philosophy and that identity that drew you to the club, is that sort of what sets 
Ajax apart from the rest of the teams in the Eredivisie? I think so, and especially, of course, compared to, to Feyenoord. You know, there's a lot of differences between Ajax and Feyenoord or Amsterdam and Rotterdam, you know, because they are intertwined. Ajax is usually a technical kind of uh, football team that plays with flair and confidence, but they are coming from a working class kind of behavior, you know, and that was like the biggest difference between both. As mentioned in the previous episode of Roots of the Rivalry, the Sueto Derby episode, we can thank schools, sports clubs, industrial workplaces, pharmacies, and cafes for birthing so many iconic clubs from around the world. And Feyenoord Rotterdam is no exception. On July 19th, 1908, four young men met at a cafe in Rotterdam to form their own club for the locals of Feyenoord, a district in southern Rotterdam. And the name they settled upon at the time was Wilhelmina. The first of four different names, actually, as the club that would become Feyenoord Rotterdam in the future went through many changes. In fact, they originally had the English spelling of Feyenoord in order to help out those Anglos, but they switched to the Dutch spelling in the 50s. But given the international success of the 1970s, they switched back to the English spelling. A lot of Anglophones, you know, people like me, probably were saying it like Feyenoord. Anyway, upon entering the Rotterdam Football Association in 1909, they changed their name once again, this time to Hilles Luis, <laughs> I hope, Football Club or HFC. Look, <laughs> that's exactly why they changed the name from Feyenoord Dutch spelling to Feyenoord English spelling. I, I tried, man. These names are tough. But anyway, as you know, the name didn't last, and so they changed their name once again, as there was already a club named HFC in the league, this time settling on... RVV Celeritas, and they even changed from their original red shirts with blue sleeves to don yellow and black stripes. After a couple of years participating in the Rotterdam Football Association, Feyenoord, or sorry, RVV Celeritas, gained promotion to the National League system, not the first division, but they had moved up, finally changing their name to SC Feyenoord. But it was also at this time where they switched back to their iconic red and white with black shorts and black socks with red and white hoops on them. While their name would change frequently in the early years and they would relocate their home ground a couple of times, one thing stayed constant. Feyenoord was the club of the people in southern Rotterdam, becoming known as the pride of the south and soon the pride of Rotterdam in general. It's, it's such a big thing for me. I, I have two sons, I have a, a lovely girlfriend, uh, I have a, a rich passionate life with friends and, and family. I have a nice job, but Feyenoord always stands central in my uh, weekly agenda. It's it's always the Sunday when we play the games. Every Monday I was like, okay, six more days to, to go to the Feyenoord match or watch the Feyenoord game. Rotterdam is a city which is well known for its harbor, its international harbor. Lots of Feyenoord supporters work something in the harbor. We always say it's Dutch, niet lullen maar poetsen, which basically means stop complaining and start working. That's the mentality of a typical Rotterdam guy or girl. Feyenoord's own history even points to how much of the club's fan base worked in the city's docklands, with the club acknowledging this as part of their DNA. They continued throughout their entire history to be known as the Working Man's Club, and they climbed the football ladder in the Netherlands relatively quickly. Just over 12 years after their founding, Feyenoord was promoted to the top league in the country. Three years after that, they won their first Dutch First Division League title. As they began to achieve success in the top flight of Dutch football, they began to amass supporters across the country, not just in Rotterdam, continuing to grow to the point of moving into their now iconic, the Kuype Stadium in 1937. In the 60s, an Austrian manager named Ernst Happel joined the club, bringing about international success when they beat Celtic at the San Siro in the 1970 European Cup Final, now known as the Champions League, of course. In all, Feyenoord would go on to become one of the early leaders in Dutch football when it came to success, competing with Ajax and later PSV in what would become the Netherlands' big three clubs. Well, AZ Alkmaar would argue it's a big four, as Johan pointed out during our conversation. There are other teams in Rotterdam, of course, but Feyenoord has eclipsed them all. Rotterdam is the second biggest city in, in Holland, after Amsterdam, of course. Unlike Amsterdam, they only have one professional football team, Ajax. Uh, Rotterdam has three, all three playing in the in the highest Eredivisie. But Feyenoord is by far the biggest club in, in Rotterdam. And especially when we're doing well, with, where, where we can see now. Feyenoord is, is such a big part of Rotterdam. Wherever you go, people always seem to talk about Feyenoord. Uh, if you go to a coffee shop to drink a coffee, then they, then they start talking about Feyenoord. If you if you sit in the train, they, they start about talking about Feyenoord. So it's it's a big part of who we are as a city. 
And so you can see there's a clear difference in the earliest inceptions of the clubs, where both have found success, but through very different paths and by attracting very different people to the clubs. And Johan actually brings up a familiar individual to help illustrate just what Feyenoord represents in a football context. Dirk Kuyt, who also played for the Dutch national team, is a player that, that we got from Utrecht when he was like 18 or 19 years old. Had a, a very nice career at Feyenoord, ended his career as well after after stints at Liverpool and then Fina Budget. But he's like more or less the player that everybody who's a Feyenoord supporter who loves him because he's not the most uh, technically gifted player. Like he, he keeps on going, keeps on going. He doesn't back down. And that's basically the mentality of Feyenoord that we've always been said, we are the club that brings up players that, that just keep on going and, and always want to fight, they have the character to, to win games. Technically sound, but not flashy. More of a workhorse than someone you'd expect to see, you know, dribbling through waves of defenders and then combining with their teammates before playing a beautifully delicate ball into the box or something. Skilled and determined, all the same, however. Representative of those hardworking individuals in southern Rotterdam who worked on the docks, who would just shut up and put the work in. And that's not to say that the people of Amsterdam are... <laughs> allergic to hard work or something. <laughs> but in those earliest days of these two clubs, there was a big difference in what we learned about Ajax over in Amsterdam. I mean, they hail from the more modern metropolitan city where artists would flock to, where the monarchy had a royal palace in the heart of the city, where things were always done with a touch of class and elegance. And their football club and football style reflected that. And that provided a main difference. Ajax is always known for for their their tactics and the, and the, and the, the wing players and nice looking football. We've never been that kind of football, even though the last couple of years it's been changing and now we uh, seem to play attractive football. But the, in the core, we are a working class club, which we always say: be normal and just uh, just do your job. Uh, unless like Ajax, they strive on being the best. And, and, Look at us and we're the best and we are the first club and but whatever they always say. Like you can say, I don't like Ajax at all, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just in explaining the differences in the founding of these two clubs, it's becoming quite evident what drives a wedge between these two giants and in turn, their fan bases. Ajax and Feyenoord are the two most popular teams in the Netherlands and along with PSV, none of them have been relegated since professional football began in 1955. They are the most successful clubs as all of the Netherlands big three have won the European Cup at least once. Ajax have done it four times. But when it comes to the Europa League or UEFA Cup, hey, Feyenoord have won that twice to their rivals' single victories. And so with the Klassiker, you have that perfect mix that any good rivalry boasts. The biggest clubs from the biggest cities in the country, a competition for titles, despite Ajax being dominant in that regard now, as well as this social or cultural difference that separates these two clubs, which is also rooted in the rivalry between the cities of Rotterdam and Amsterdam. They are mainly driven by their huge harbor, you know, the biggest one in Europe. We are known also for being uh, yeah, the number one trade city with, with lovely canals and, and other sites within the city, you know, it's different architecture and, and the way it looks like. Where Rotterdam had the biggest harbor in Europe and even the world at one time, before it was overtaken by not one, but multiple harbors in China, Amsterdam built itself up through its trade practices, becoming one of the trade hubs of Europe. Yet another reason for the cities to see each other as rivals. In fact, there's a saying that illustrates the cultural divide between these two. While Amsterdam dreams, Rotterdam works. And then of course, there's the other cultural aspect that most people around the world can relate to. One city, often the capital of a country, believing that they are the center of the universe, or at least those from outside of that city believe that that's what its inhabitants think that they are. That they're the gift to the nation or the center of the universe and everyone else is below them. Hey, what's up, Toronto? <laughs> I'm sorry, people from Toronto, but it's true. That's the vibe you give off to the rest of Canada. Anyway, that sentiment, of course, has bled into the football rivalry as well. They seem to see us as a little brother, like, oh, how cute. And they, they try to do so well, but whatever they try, we're not good enough. And if they have a good play, oh, well, we buy him like Berghuis. In Amsterdam, of course, it's the capital. It's the glamorous city. It's the city that attracts a lot of tourists. It's a city that basically thinks of itself as, as an independent country. They think the country stops at the borders of Amsterdam, even though there's only 1 million people living there and there's 16 million people living outside of Amsterdam in the rest of the country. They have some arrogancy. They think they are the center of 
at least Holland, but ask a real Amsterdam guy, you will think Amsterdam is the best city in the world. Everything happens in Amsterdam. That's that's totally different here in Rotterdam. How we call it in Amsterdam, uh, in Amsterdam, Moxie. They find us really cocky and arrogant, and we're just finding ourselves confident and try to look at ourselves while Rotterdam, you know, is, is more focused on trying to surpass us and always coming in second with certain stuff, you know, that bothers them a lot, I think. So how the Feyenoord supporters view this rivalry is that you essentially have the glitz and glam of Amsterdam, the dreamers, as the saying goes, the artists from the cosmopolitan city that looks down on the rest of the country, while Rotterdam see themselves as salt of the earth people, middle class people who are more relatable to the everyman. We'll just put that work in. How do Ajax supporters view the rivalry? They respect Feyenoord as a club for said work ethic, while also saying, Rotterdam is more focused on Amsterdam than Amsterdam is focused on Rotterdam. If, with all due respect, if you are the biggest club within this country, and the stats speak for itself, you cannot argue about it. If you look up the stats, you know, with 36 titles, Feyenoord only having 15. You know, the difference is huge. So is it arrogance if you have the best stats throughout all those decades, or is it just realism? Beyond the cultural divide and competing to be the best, actually, Ajax pointed out that in the 70s or so, the competition for titles was much closer. 50 years ago, the difference between Ajax and Feyenoord was we had 14 titles, they had 10 titles. They just won five more titles in 50 years, while we won 22. So the difference back then was only four. The difference now is 21 titles. But beyond the competition for titles, of course, at that time in the early 1970s, a certain Johan Cruyff was helping Ajax to dominate both domestically and on the European stage, winning the European Cup in 71, 72, and 73. The funny thing, this came at a time of general Dutch dominance in football, because if you'll remember from earlier in the video, who beat Celtic in the 1970 final at the San Siro? Feyenoord. But Ajax couldn't let them be the only Dutch side to win the European Cup. Hell, they had to surpass them there as well and take that accomplishment. Well, not take it away. You can't take it away from Feyenoord because the ink was already dry in the history books, but to surpass them again. However, in 1983, Feyenoord took something away from Ajax. Kind of. What or who was it? None other than Johan Cruyff. And it had to do with Ajax not wanting to give him another contract because he was already a little bit at age and wanted to give new players, you know, a chance, youth players like Van Basten and, you know, those kind of huge talents that were up and coming. Cruyff felt surpassed by that and he was a little bit, he had a little bit of grief. And he was like, okay, you guys do not want me, then I will go to the competitors. And your biggest legend, the best player ever moving to your competitors, that's a hard pill to swallow, you know? Feyenoord signing an icon like Cruyff was a bit divisive. On the one hand, you're signing not only a Dutch football icon, but an icon of the sport in general. On the other hand, he's someone who you have rooted against for your entire life as he had helped Ajax win eight league titles and numerous cups throughout your shared history. He grew up five minutes from Ajax's stadium on top of all of that. He was an Ajax guy through and through. And that feeling was felt in the first match for Feyenoord as whistles rang out at De Kuyp and banners read Feyenoord forever. Cruyff never. But given Cruyff was in his 19th year as a professional at 36 years old, this wasn't anything he couldn't handle. And he had only one mission. He wanted to become champions with Feyenoord. And he did. So he was the one laughing at the end. That's one way to win people over. And not only did he win the league, but he helped Feyenoord win the cup as well. And this came after Ajax had destroyed Feyenoord 8-2 in the first Klassieker of that season, 83-84. Feyenoord beat Ajax 4-1 in the second fixture of the regular season after Cruyff had helped Feyenoord develop their tactics. And they beat them in the round of 16 of the cup as well. All of this after Cruyff had assured the nation that Feyenoord would win the league. He called his shot and he made it. And what made this bravado all the more impressive? He said it after Feyenoord had lost 8-2 to Ajax, saying, quote, It was only two points. The prizes are given out at the end of the competition, at the end of the 34 games. Just wait, you'll see. So that Amsterdam moxie, bravado, arrogance, whatever you want to call it, that the Feyenoord supporters have so much disdain for, it did help them bring a couple of titles in. Definitely a sore spot for the Ajax board that said Cruyff's services weren't needed at the club anymore. But a transfer in the opposite direction would bring a lot of heat to the rivalry as well. He was the captain of Feyenoord for many years. It was their best player. And he had a minimum fee release plus. And Ajax just at the beginning of uh, last season was like, okay, we want to buy you. 
And, you know, it, it doesn't happen a lot going from Ajax to Feyenoord or Feyenoord to Ajax. And I think uh, the city of Rotterdam and the police, I think they had a massive job to do because they were so afraid that the bus of Ajax uh, was not even able to enter the stadium because of Berghuis, which was the first time Berghuis played for Ajax since his transfer from Feyenoord to Ajax with the supporters. Berghuis has been getting death threats and, and, and threats on social media towards his family and towards himself for almost two years now because it doesn't sit well in Rotterdam, you know, uh, their best player, their captain moving to their biggest rivals. But the Ajax supporters aren't saints either. I mean, no entire fan base is. As Ajax points out, they treated their former goalkeeper Kenneth Vermeer with similarly vile actions as well upon him leaving Ajax for Feyenoord. In our supporter sense, they had a, a, a doll with a, how do you call it in English? When a you hang yourself yeah. with his appearance in the stands and uh, that was also a nasty thing from our supporters to do so those two things the last five six seven years heated it up again but there's one event that was a dark mark in dutch football the battle of beverwijk in march of 1997. That was the first part of, of course, hooliganism was also getting bigger and bigger here in Holland. There has been a fight between Feyenoord and Ajax supporter in which one Ajax supporter lost his life. Carlo Picorni, he died that day. And this was something that, that he did, like the tension between the clubs or at least the hardcore supporters of the clubs, the tension got heated by that. And that was one moment in history that is a black page, I think, in both clubs' history, because if somebody dies, that's always a harsh thing. Thankfully, Carlo and his memory are still honored every March. And while his death will has come as a shock, 12 years later, the two sets of fans perhaps hadn't learned their lesson, as a fight after a match in Amsterdam in 2009 led to the two cities agreeing that away supporters wouldn't be allowed to attend matches as a way of mitigating as much violence as they can. The government had to intervene. Originally, they said five years without supporters, and they extended it and it's still active now. So we're now in 2023. So this was also a defining moment in our history because we're without away supporters for now almost four 14 years. While it absolutely is a shame that the away supporters' presence can't be heard in any De Classiker, it doesn't take away from the intensity on the pitch or what these matches mean to those involved. As mentioned in this video, it goes beyond football, as most intense rivalries do, as this isn't just one club versus another, but one city versus another, one way of life clashing with another. Sure, PSV has overtaken Feyenoord of late as far as the competitive sporting rivalry goes in the Netherlands, but Feyenoord versus Ajax will always be the top rivalry in the Netherlands, and one of the best in the world. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you learned something new, consider leaving a like to help out the channel. Another big thank you to both Johan and Ajax for helping me with this video and providing their expertise, which was invaluable once again. Remember to check out all of their links below. Beyond that, thank you for watching this. I'm Adrian, this is Rona TV, and enjoy the football. Ciao.